Welcome back to the Hard Run Box podcast for episode 27, as well as re-ranking the current GPUs that are on the market uh, at the moment, including adding some additions that we didn't put into our previous rankings. We have a pretty interesting discussion about CPU scaling. Should you upgrade your CPU? Where are things at? Performance, all sorts of interesting things in that discussion. So yeah, a bit of a dual episode here, two main topics. So hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get into it. Steve, we're back. Another podcast episode. Again, not much has been happening really, so we'll have to make up some interesting topics to talk about. What's been happening? What's been happening in the testing world, the CPU, GPU testing world at the moment for you? So should I make something up or tell you the truth? Uh, well, whatever's going to be more entertaining for the listeners is the path you should take there, I think. Jeez, um, it's, that's a tough one. Well, <laughs> I'll go with the truth. Spent about a week doing, or just over a week, doing a big benchmark comparison between the 7900 Jari and the 4070 Super. Um, okay. We didn't desperately need that content, but I thought it'll you know allow me to look at some new games, um, you know, Horizon yep. Forbidden West and a few others. So did that. It was about 58 game configurations. So not 58 individual games, just game configurations so you know as an example cyberpunk 2077 was tested rasterization using the ultra preset then it was tested Mm -hmm. ray tracing using the ultra ray tracing preset and then upscaling was tested with the ultra ray tracing preset so at at three resolutions so a serious amount of testing there for each uh product so that will be coming out just after the podcast. Uh, but for those who are signed up to the Harbor Unbox Float Plane account, they'll probably get access to that uh, well before this. So nice. It's, it's, it's <laughs> difficult to do. So I've been working on that. Uh, what else? What What was the other video I did uh, earlier in the week? Well, you I... just did a video on uh, CPU and GPU scaling with the Ryzen mm. 5 5600 that I thought was pretty interesting. I enjoyed watching that video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that video, I actually did all the testing for that a while ago, um, more oh, than yeah. a month ago. So I did the original video, which was the Q&A question where mm-hmm. uh, the, w- the question was posed, you know, is it better to buy a 7800X 3D and an RTX 4070 or a Ryzen 5 7600 and a 4070 Ti? And if you remember yep. in the Q&A, we basically said, well, it's probably going to depend on the games you play, how you play them. And yeah. Uh, a surprising amount of people didn't like that answer. They said, oh, you definitely min-max, go with the the faster GPU. That's always going to result in better game performance, you know, and mm-hmm. how, how dare you guys say that it, it depends. <laughs> so the, the, I was a bit surprised by that. So I thought, well, I'll look into it because I'd, I'd be surprised if in those competitive shooters, the faster CPU didn't make more of a difference because you're almost always cpu limited in in those situations and i know this from benchmarking like yeah you benchmark a game even like starcraft 2 for example which is a an rts style game pretty much no matter what graphic settings you use and resolution to play it you usually end up cpu limited with high-end hardware so yeah. interesting video i enjoyed that one released the video it was a bit of a different benchmark it was a q a type benchmark and then a lot of people said you know, the Ryzen 5 5600, for example, was a really popular CPU. Where does it slot in here with, you know, the RTX 4080? So added that to the data, added a, a few more configurations. So it was a bit of a weird, almost a mismatch of configurations, I guess, but it was just one of those interesting almost system benchmarks. So really yeah. enjoyed that. And yeah, the results were at times surprising, but I think for the most part, pretty expected, pretty predictable. It's always interesting with these these videos. I feel like a lot of people gravitate when they're doing, you know, the min-max sort of things. They're mm-hmm. like, they look at the 4K results. They're like, okay, that's the most GPU-limited mm. scenario. So I'll look at it and I'll be like, ah, oh, okay, if I pair a 4080 with a 5600, it's generally going to give you pretty good performance. But I think what was interesting in some of those results was the 1440p results, which is what I expect a lot of people with the Ryzen 5 5600 are more likely to be playing at. And seeing things like that a 4080 can be quite limited by that CPU at that resolution and not just in the competitive games. You, you tested titles like Star Wars Jedi Survivor, for example, where mm-hmm. it was quite clearly limiting performance in that sort of game, especially if you're playing it with ray tracing enabled. So yeah, I always find those things interesting because you know I've always been, at least prior to doing this job more seriously, I was always a min-maxer, like a big, like get the, get the crappy CPU, go as low as you possibly can 
and then get a very, very powerful uh, GPU and try and pair those two things together. Yeah, I think that mentality has shifted a bit because the industry shifted a bit. If you think back when I probably around the point in time you're talking about, uh, it was probably, you know, do I get a Core i5 or a Core i7? Do I need hyper-threading? Generally speaking, the answer was no. Yeah. Uh, and it was, what were your options? You sort of got a four-core processor. Uh, even then, the cache made probably a bit of difference or probably the most difference because they were all four-core. But there wasn't a huge difference in CPU power and therefore for a long time, while the, the, the CPU performance stagnated, so did I think game development around how they utilize the CPU and what they could do. Yeah. Whereas since about 2017 onwards, obviously the introduction of Ryzen, we've seen many more cores. The CPUs themselves get much faster with improved IPC and all that sort of stuff, larger caches, uh, higher clock speeds, even. Uh, it's just improved CPU performance. So they're, they're leveraging the CPUs probably. I don't know if it's fair to say more. There's just more of the CPU to leverage now. So when you go back a bit in terms of CPU performance, the drop-off can be more significant than it would have been previously. So yeah, min-maxing doesn't necessarily work out as well as it used to. But then the whole min-maxing makes sense from your perspective because you are predominantly a single-player gamer that prioritizes visual quality over frame rate within reason, I think it's fair to say. Whereas you weren't playing Quake Rocket Arena or the original like Counter-Strike games or anything like that competitively because if you were doing yeah. that, you would be downgrading your visuals. Like I used to watch the the pro Rocket Arena guys play at LAN parties and stuff and you were almost you could almost count the pixels. Like the resolution <laughs> was just that low and they, yeah. they're just going for hundreds of frames per second. If you came from that style of gaming, the, the min-max thing probably wouldn't have been a thing. You'd always sort of prioritize uh, uh, or at least balance CPU and GPU performance without doing them in max. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much as expected from these results, right? That mm-hmm. it, it really does depend. And I guess that's why I guess people got angry in the comments about previously is that they were all the single-player gamers sitting around saying like, oh, I don't need a 7800X 3D. I should put that into the GPU. But I guess, like you say, it sort of depends. And I think even for single-player gaming, it would depend on the resolution. Like there are still lots of single-player gamers that haven't upgraded to a 4K display yet. And it does seem like that, well, not always the case, but there's it's coming to those edge cases where 1440p, you can be limited on older CPUs. Now, you tested the Ryzen 5 5600, but if you mm-hmm. had like even a generation prior to that, like say a Ryzen 5 3600, I imagine these days in in some titles, especially games like, you know, again, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, that you're pretty limited in what your upgrade path on the GPU could be. Mm-hmm. Like if you're upgrading to a 4080, that's, you're probably going to be limited, you know, in games like Starfield as well, those sorts of titles. So, yeah, you, I guess as more games come out, you can't just be neglecting the CPU entirely when it comes to single-player gaming. You probably mm-hmm. don't need the fastest, best-of-the-best type mm-hmm. processors. Mm-hmm. But something that's you know still relatively recent seems to be giving a decent performance uplift. Again, it does depend on the configurations. You should probably go and watch the videos to see exactly <laughs> where you know the configurations make sense and those sort of things. But you know, I, I would think that with the release of products like Zen Five and new games being released towards the end of this year, that people who do own products like a Ryzen Five Fifty Six Hundred are probably going to start coming into that. Should I upgrade? Should I not mm-hmm. upgrade? position even for single player gaming it's it's sort of down to the individual it's it's a tough one to have these conversations because i don't i try to avoid knowing that there are people who have they they play different games they have different requirements for how they play those games so i try to avoid the blanket statements because yeah yeah it's it sounds from their perspective i sound insane (laughs) i sound like a crazy person because (laughs) the other day i I think i mentioned this i was playing Fortnite on a system where using the settings i normally use limited to me to what was probably on average about 150 frames per second and it felt awful like uh, as soon as i got i was i was playing for a minute i couldn't work out what was going on i'm like why does this feel so laggy i'm looking at my ping and then I thought, oh, that no, must be a frame rate type lag. And I looked at the frame rate, 150. 
as soon as it dips below 200, I can, I can notice like when it dips, you know, 50 FPS below 200, I notice straight away. It just mm-hmm. doesn't, it doesn't feel good. It, it's not, it's, it's just not how I like to play the game. So I usually aim for between 200 and 300 FPS and that's really smooth and, and plays really well. So there is, there's a difference and you could, I, I'd love for you to like blind test me on this at one point to see if I'm full of it. Like, you know, somehow yeah, low, nice. lower my FPS to 150 almost dynamically and I can guarantee the second you like pulled that lever and lowered it to 150, I'd be able to tell you straight away. And the second you pump yeah. it up over 200, I'd be able to tell you straight away. It'd be like turning a light on and off. That That's how obvious it would be to me. But to convince yeah. some people of that is very difficult. They're just like, there's no way you could, it's, it's so high already, you couldn't tell. But I, I mean, tell- we hear that, how often do we hear that from like 30 FPS versus 60 FPS even, which I think is like, wow. I find that like hard ridiculously. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I've seen on Twitter, there was, I think maybe a week or so ago, there was like, <laughs> at least among the console gamers, I think this is around like the release of Dragon's Dogma 2, which runs terribly on consoles. People were like, oh, you don't need more than 30 FPS. You know, that comes up every time there's like a good game that only runs at like 30 FPS. And so they were saying like, you know, you don't need 60 FPS. And I think a lot of those comparisons, like I think your setup would be very interesting. If I had like a control knob where I could change the FPS you were playing as you were playing the game. Mm-hmm. I think if I ramped it down to 100 FPS, 150 FPS, you would notice that because of the instantaneous change. Whereas I think a lot of the testing that people who claim they can't see 60 FPS or the benefits of 120 FPS or whatever, it's like they play a game at 30 FPS, then they turn off the console, they go away, the next day they come and they play a different game and it's 60 FPS. And you're sort of you're thinking about what's the current situation I'm in versus whatever I remember experiencing like yeah. a week ago. Whereas if you did it straight away, like if there was mm. a game that in one scene it was 60 FPS, then it immediately dropped to 30 FPS, people would be like, what's gone on? This is <laughs> like the worst experience. This is so bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're saying and I, I absolutely agree. But at the same time, I struggle to believe that there's someone that can hop on like forget gaming all right if i watch a video like i'm watching formula one or something like that or or, or some video with movement in it it doesn't even have to be that crazy it doesn't have to be an f1 car and it's at 30 fps and then i go away a week later and watch it at 60 a week later i'll be like wow this motion is much more fluid it looks much more pleasing to my eye i know people complain about 60 fps video but Boy, oh boy, do I prefer it. Um, it, it it's, a, it's a little weird compared to 30 because you're used to that like motion blurring effect. That, um, yeah. But but yeah, I, I prefer it and I, I pick it up straight away. And the, yeah. yeah, especially for sports, it makes a huge difference, really. Mm-hmm. Anything where you need that sort of realistic motion type effect. So yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, I think it'll be hard for people to justify their you know, higher refresh rate displays as we sort of get to the the point where, you know, if you can't really tell what 60 FPS or 120 FPS is, how would you ever consider, you know, buying like a 500 hertz display? You'll just never uh, think yeah. that that's a benefit. I, I, I think that's a, well, I don't know, everyone's built different, I guess, but I, I, I think that's a minority that will look at 30 FPS gaming and 60 FPS gaming and go, they're the same thing or they, they're, you know, because the, also the with Fortnite, for example, going from 150 FPS to 200 or 300 FPS, that's clearly going to look a little bit smoother. But I don't think it's the look that jumps out at me as much as the input. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's really when I'm looking around, it just yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel right. That's what I notice it straight away. But obviously, if you're not whipping around so much, it's yeah. I, I don't know how much of it's visual. There is a little bit there. It's mm-hmm. it's a, a, obviously it's not as smooth uh but at the same time i'm only playing on a 165 hertz monitor so not sure on that one i think it'll be mostly input lag th- but it, yeah yeah i know the guys over at Blurbusters who we use their ufo test for a lot of our monitor content they've done a lot of research and testing and have participated in research that has tested you know the limits really of what people can see in terms of frame rates and refresh rates and things like that and some of the conclusions that they've come to, you know, that have been very interesting to me are things like that a lot of the effects that you see that uh, are very dependent on the person. So there's some people that genuinely will not be able to see high refresh rates just because that's the way that 
I guess their brain works. And there's other people who have much higher sensitivity for certain effects than others. So things mm-hmm. like, you know, the flicker, some, some monitors have backlight flicker that's from just the way the backlight works. And there's some people that are really sensitive to that. Even if it's like a 10,000 hertz flicker or something, they'll get headaches from it because they're just more sensitive to that sort of effect than other people. Whereas for mm-hmm. me, that's not something that I find problematic at all. Whereas I've had people who have bought OLED monitors being like, man, I'm, get, I'm getting like eye strain from this. And you look into it and it's, it's from those sorts of effects. But then on top of that, they've shown things like, you know, people always say, oh, the limit, you know, you can't see above whatever. It's like the <laughs> limits are way higher than you think they are. They're like thousands of hertz, like thousands of hertz before you stop being able to discern the differences. Things like, you know, being able to determine what the text is on like a map as you're moving it at a faster and faster rate. The faster the motion is, the higher the hertz needs to be before you can stop being able to to notice what the text is and, and th- you know, the clarity of the text mm-hmm. and things like that, mm-hmm. which is very interesting. And I've always found that sort of research to be, yeah, quite enlightening and just sort of showing how, yeah, as we've mentioned a lot in our sort of content, that one thing that may apply to one person doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, mm-hmm. but that, you know, the benefits that you may be describing in a game like Fortnite are certainly real. Like you can't just dismiss them and be like, you know, oh yeah, you're just a, a, a cracked multiplayer gamer or something. Like I'm never going to notice like the input in, in single player games because, you know, I don't need... 200 FPS in the games that I usually play, but I could certainly notice the difference between playing like a Star Wars Jedi Survivor at 200 FPS, which is probably mm-hmm. impossible in that game, and 100 <laughs> FPS. Like yep. 200 FPS is better. Like it just is. It's just, I guess it depends on whether you need that for the game or not. That's right. And uh, that's why I'm more skewed towards the preference of FPS because first and foremost, navigating through the game, aiming, all that sort of stuff has to feel good, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Uh, And when I play Cyberpunk at 60 FPS, it does not feel good. And look, we've had hundreds, thousands of people comment on our videos agreeing with me on this, saying they hate playing single-player games like Cyberpunk at 60 FPS, 90 is their minimum, which is sort of what I said my minimum acceptable frame rate for playing any game that's a shooter where you aim at stuff is 90 Mm -hmm. fps below that it's just the the input and the aiming is unacceptable to me i really do need 90 real frames per second so yeah a a 90 is like sort of my minimum really you know obviously i like to be north of 100 but i'll i'll happily play a game like cyberpunk at the highest possible visual quality settings while maintaining around 90 FPS on average or ideally a sort of a fixed frame rate. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. it's just what I, I like. I find aiming and shooting in games more satisfying when the input is at least, you know, that smooth. Yeah, and I, I think that's fair enough. And I'm sure you, our, our opinions on this won't surprise people considering we have talked about this a few times, about our preferences and things like mm-hmm. that. And just the but, my uh, it's very surprise when I always see people from just, I guess I think it comes more outside of like the PC enthusiast space, people preferring or thinking that lower frame rates are fine. I'm always just like, hmm, well, it's interesting. Like I'm not dismissing that opinion as being your that person's opinion. It's just an interesting that, yeah, someone would have that opinion considering I just so strongly disagree with it. Well, that's right. It's like, yeah, if you like playing at 30 FPS, then more more power to you, I guess. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just not a way I could enjoy the game or play the game that way. Um, If if I was somehow forced to play all games forever at 30 FPS, uh, you wouldn't find me playing games anymore. I would go find something else to do. But circling back to the the reason why we're having this conversation that we always like to start talking about frame rates is yeah, the whole CPU performance at 4k doesn't matter. And I'll probably do another video that really looks at that in a lot of detail, like Mm -hmm. lowering the quality settings, because as, as we found in the past, generally speaking, if using an RTX 4080, as we did on a Ryzen 5 5,600, in Starfield, if that limits you to 70 FPS, no matter, you keep lowering the resolution and you keep seeing 70 FPS because it's a hard CPU limit. Generally speaking, there's really no way to overcome that. So there Mm -hmm. are some games that will lighten the CPU load, like NPC count, crowd density, that sort of stuff. 
to what degree is hard to say. It'll be on a per game basis. But yeah, you can't just like with a with a GPU, if you if you're getting 30 FPS on your GPU on ultra, high might get you to 40, medium might get you to 50, 55, and then low might get you above 60. So you've got that ability to scale the quality settings and the visual difference is of often very noticeable, but there is a way to still play the game at acceptable mm-hmm. frame rates. Yeah. But if you don't have enough CPU processing power, and we're not talking about CPU cores here, we're just talking about overall CPU performance. If in in if uh, in whatever way the game utilizes your CPU, there's not enough of the CPU to achieve the targeted frame rate. Generally speaking, you're stuffed. Like there's just no way to flick a toggle and yep. double your FPS. Uh, it, it can't be done. So if you're only getting 70 FPS in Starfield at 1080p with a 5600, you're at best going to get 70 FPS at 4K. And if you require 90 FPS, then that CPU uh, is on its last legs and you're probably going to be looking for an upgrade to get you over the line of whatever your FPS target is. So, yeah, but I I guess that misconception's come about because people see benchmarks and they see, you know, the bar graphs going down, 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 and you get to to 4K and they're at sub-60 FPS frame rates, generally, you know, 40 FPS, 30 FPS. Yeah, yeah. And the CPU makes no difference there. And then they conclude that the CPU makes no difference at 4K. And it's like, in that example, yes, that's true because you're 100% GPU limited, but your the CPU only doesn't matter if you're happy with 30 FPS. And if you're happy mm-hmm. with 30 FPS, then it's not 4K that's so much what you should fixate on. It's just the CPU delivers 30 FPS and therefore I can play at any resolution where the GPU delivers 30 FPS. So yeah, and I think a lot of that comes from the testing generally preferencing like ultra settings mm-hmm. uh, or ultra plus ray tracing. Whereas a lot of the time, like if you, yeah, like for example, right now I'm looking at the chart from your GPU scaling review for Starfield, and you tested ultra quality and at 4K with a 7800X read in 48, you were getting 58 FPS at 4K. Now, if I was playing that game, and I was like, okay. I don't like 58 FPS, I would just drop the quality settings to high and I'm probably not missing out on too many visual aspects because typically in games, the difference between ultra and high isn't that large and you can get maybe that up to about 80 FPS. But as you say, like because so much of the testing that reviewers do focuses on ultra settings at 4K typically, they're not showing those cases where it's like high or medium settings that someone with a 4K display might be doing or potentially they're playing at ultra settings with some some level of upscaling which is then you know reducing gpu load as well which again like if you're cpu limited features like dlss and fsr don't really do very much like they're just not effective so yeah i think it'll be very interesting to see how those sorts of things go in your sort of 4k video now i'm sure you know upscaling things like that isn't technically running it at 4k but you know, certainly reducing visual settings is a, is a typical thing that I would expect 4K gamers to be doing in a lot of the latest and greatest, especially single player titles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Um, so while you're just talking about that as an, another example, so we've done in the past GPU and CPU scaling videos um, mm-hmm. where we look at multiple different GPUs, CPUs, games, resolutions, and probably more crucially for this discussion, quality settings. And so I tested all the Ryzen 5 processors available at the time. So it's from the the 1600X, the 2600X, the 3600X, and the 5600X. So this is a few years old, this content at this point in time. Yeah. But as one example, I tested Cyberpunk 2077. Let's just take the 1440p results. Uh, Using the ultra quality uh, settings at 1440p, the best performance I could get out of the Ryzen 5 1600 was 74 frames per second with a 1% lows of 52, which was a mm-hmm. bit slower than the other GPUs. But then if I wanted 100 FPS to go to the medium quality preset, I got the exact same average and 1% lows with the 1600X. So it just so happened that what I got at the ultra quality settings was the limit of that particular cpu with an this was an rtx 3090 mind you whereas the 5600x went on to average 111 fps where it was only doing 80 fps at ultra but if i wanted more than 80 i could go to medium and you know get another 20 fps but that wasn't an option with the 1600x it was 76 or you know mid 70s 
was the frame rate, no matter what the quality settings were. That was the peak performance. So, and again, then if you go down to like, you know, a 5600X, that was getting 27 FPS on average with ultra and then 42 FPS with medium. So the 1600X wasn't the bottleneck there. It was the GPU. So yep. it gets complicated, essentially. <laughs> it really yeah, does. Really, yeah. But I guess the takeaway is where people say, you know, Gamers Nexus, Harbor Unboxed, name any other media outlet, them testing CPUs, particularly lower end, more entry level CPUs with an RTX 4090 is terribly misleading, useless data, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not true at all. It's showing you the peak performance of that particular CPU. It doesn't matter that it's a 4090. If a Core Mm -hmm. i3 can only do 60 FPS in a given title with a 4090, it means that's the peak performance it will do with any GPU using lower quality settings at a lower resolution. It gives you all the information you need. The only problem is if you're watching reviews incorrectly, you're doing it as a prompt to upgrade. So, oh, you know, am I happy with my performance? I don't know. Am I CPU limited? I don't know. Do I want to buy a new CPU? I think so. Like, that's the kind of information you've got to be going into these reviews with. You haven't actually worked anything out for yourself. And you're just sitting there saying, Steve from Gamers Nexus, convince me that I need to upgrade my CPU. And then he's showing you that the new one's 50% faster than your old one. And then people are saying that's misleading. But it's like, no, no, that's actually how much faster it is. It can sustain those frame rates. That's the throughput of the processor Mm -hmm. in a given title. Whether you can utilize that or not with your existing hardware is another story. But again, if you want 100 FPS in Cyberpunk, you can't do it with a Ryzen 5 1600X. Um, You can't do it with a 2600X based on this data either. So you need to know what can I do it with. Um, So anyway, it's just, it's about... We've talked about this at length, but that's why reviewers really everywhere test the way they test because it's the best way to test. It's Mm -hmm. it it gives you all the information you need. Uh, You just got to work out: do you actually need a new CPU or not? And that's kind of up to you to work out. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot of people watching reviews seem to want you know the numbers in the review to equal the numbers that you'll get Mm -hmm. from your configuration. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, again, I've always looked at reviews, and I think the way people should look at reviews is just generally things like percentage differences. You know, again, you have to sort of figure out your your limits and things which we've just been talking about. So, yeah, I mean, we're probably not going to remove those comments anytime soon i imagine that people no. will still be commenting that on on reviews but yeah yeah it's just good to i guess get info having more information is always better for people so that they can you know make the <sighs> it, most informed decisions that they can exactly it's really simple you have a cpu you've decided you need to upgrade it because you're cpu bound in most games super easy to work out you've done the minimum amount of you know research required on your end that i can't do for you now you need a new cpu how fast mm-hmm. can you go? Probably determined by your budget. Okay, you're happy to spend $200 on a CPU. Here are your options. Now you kind of want to know how they compare in terms of gaming performance, not how they stack up when they're all GPU limited. Like you want to know if one is 20% faster than the other at the same price regardless of whether you can use that 20 percent now or not you you, you want to get the best value for your money you want to get the, the best yeah. product so you do that research that's why we test the way we test and then the assumption sort of is that every time you upgrade your gpu you don't upgrade your cpu at the same time like not every yeah. time so the cpu you're buying now that offers you 20 percent more performance at the same price will be a benefit when you upgrade your gpu All right, let's get into the other thing that I want to do in this video, which has been quite an interesting discussion already, to be honest. So I probably could have skipped this for a different video, but I'll do it. I'll do it in this one anyway, in this podcast, which is updating our GPU rankings. Because oh, Tim, you said you were going to do this. I said I was going to do this. <sighs> All the GPUs I think have been released, so it, it makes a good good point to okay, to okay. update the rankings. And people seem to really enjoy our ranking of all the GPUs that we did. Almost six months ago now, which feels like it wasn't six months ago, but it was. So (laughs) time flies. Anyway, I thought I'll first go and just say what our current rankings are. And then we'll go into whether any of these rankings need to be adjusted. And then we've got four new GPUs to add to the pack. So Okay, good. Yeah, because I can't actually remember what I picked. (laughs) 
So our current rankings are the RTX 4090 was in first position. So I'm going to go from best to worst as far as we've ranked them. So 4090 we ranked as the best GPU. Then mm-hmm. the RX 7800 XT, the RTX 4070, the RX 7900 XT, and the RTX 4080. So those were our top uh, five GPUs. Then in the middle pack, we've got the 7900 XT, XTX, the 7700 XT, the 7900 GRE and the 7600 from AMD, so four AMD GPUs in a row. And then the bottom four products we decided were the RTX 4060, the RTX 4070 Ti, the RTX 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte and the RTX 4060 Ti 16 gigabyte. So 16 gigabyte model being the worst. That was based on the original pricing as well because that's dropped now to 450 yes. from 500. So Yes, that is true. So there's probably a few interesting positions here that probably need to be decided upon things like is the 16 gigabyte model actually worse than the 8 gigabyte model a couple of products have changed in price the 4090 for example has gone up in price by 200 dollars these days the 7900 xt has dropped in price by almost a hundred dollars us compared to september of last year and there's been some minor adjustments to things. Obviously, the 4070 Ti has dropped in price by $120 US because of the introduction of the supermodel. And then the 7900 GRE as well has been re-released at $550. Back when we put this in the rankings, it was the, the OEM-only card. Yeah, so, so that was 650 back then. Yes, it was. So maybe we should just start at the bottom of the rankings. Should the 8-gig card go below the 16-gig card? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I, I think the the eight gig cards dropped in price from what ten to twenty dollars, but we've mm-hmm. had fifteen uh, fifty dollars fifty dollars taken yep. off the sixteen gigabyte uh, model. But yeah, we, we've had other examples of games where the sixteen gigabyte model is better. Um, yeah, f- uh, Horizon Forbidden West we talked about in the last podcast uh, that ran much better for me on the sixteen gigabyte model at around sixty fps uh, using the highest quality settings, where the eight gigabyte card was much lower FPS with a whole heap of stuttering. I don't know if they've patched the game and addressed that yet or whether it'll get addressed or not. I don't know. But yeah, it's a good looking game. It seems like a pretty well optimized game already. Uh, but yeah, 8, eight gigabytes sucks. At that at that performance tier and that price point, 8 gigabytes for $400-ish is garbage. Yeah, and they haven't dropped the price by anywhere near as much as they thought they would have by now. Like back when we would have mm. been talking about the 4060 to 8 gigabyte, that would have been just a few months on from the launch of the 16 gig model. So they would have only been on the market for a couple of months. Mm-hmm. Now it's been, you know, nine months or so. And really the 8 gig card is still as crappy as it was to begin with. Like that card should be much closer to $300 US and it's dropped in price, as you say, like $10, $20 at best. Mm-hmm. Whereas the 4060 Ti, like I feel like if you're, if you're buying an NVIDIA GPU, and you've got about this amount of money to spend, you would definitely get the 16 gig card instead of the 8 gig card. So it should be ahead in the rankings based on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as we move up, we've obviously got the 4070 Ti, which is dropped in price, but I'm not sure whether that would do enough to change its rankings. It's probably a run out discount as it's you know currently available for just under $700, but that's just going to be for the remaining stock. It's not like they're continuing this in the market. So I feel like that should probably stay there. Yeah, sure. It's so complicated doing this off the top of air that being able to sort of assess all the performance and prices, but let's just go with that. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of a general thing looking at the features mm-hmm. and the launch and current, like it's factoring in everything is sort of how I would look at it, like how it's been on the market, all those sorts of things. The next tier up was sort of, we had the RX 7600 above the RTX 4060, but both in you know the lower part. Yeah, I think that's still fair. I, I, I don't know if pricing's changed much there, but... Yeah, not really from what I looked at. The 4060 mm-hmm. has actually, I think back in September was about $280. Now it's more like $290 to $300. The RX 7600 has been basically $260 for the last six months. So nothing's really changed there. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest consideration would be the 7900 GRE, we sort of, I remember th- just throwing that in there. We were just sort of like, man, it's whatever. We'll just put it in the middle somewhere. Is it going to be below a 7700 XT with the well, re-review? The 7700 XT has dropped in price a bit. It's closer to $400 now. Yes. So it is quite a bit cheaper, the 7700 XT, but then yeah, I haven't done an updated how that thing. I didn't actually bother covering the 7700 XT much beyond the review, yep. I don't think. 
Yeah. It's hard to say. I feel like the 7900 well, XTX is probably maybe a bit high ranked uh, at the moment. No, I, I think maybe the 7800 XT is higher ranked because realistically the GRE is the same product as the 7800 XT yes. in terms of yep. cost per frame. So wherever we put the 7800 XT, logic dictates that the 7900 GRE has to be close by. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And we've got the 7800 XT in second position. Like they're basically the same, in terms of value, they're the same product. I don't even know yeah. which one should go first, um, but they should go together because they're essentially the same thing. Yeah, that's right. It's if you have $500 to spend, you get the 7800 XT. If you've got $550, you get the 7800 It's like splitting so hairs. I've put those two together. I think the discussion around those two products should be where does the 4070 and where does the 4070 super slot in? Because wherever those products go is going to determine sort of the probably the upper part of the rankings because I think I think that those mid-range products are probably the better products that we're seeing in the market at the moment. So let's first decide, right, should the 4070 be above or below those products? I have got the data slash data in front of me right now. So you had in your review, yeah, the 7900 GR8, $550 and the 4070 at $540. So it's a little cheaper now, but you had the for at least 4K rasterization, 1440p rasterization. You had the 7900 GR8 and 7800 XT pretty clearly ahead of the 4070 and the 4070 Super. 4070 Super slightly ahead, uh, in terms of, you know, the 7800 XT was slightly ahead of the 4070 Super, the 4070 a step back. But then obviously that flips around if you were interested in ray tracing at this performance tier where then, you know, the 4070 Super is the better value product there. I think based on that data, you'd have to have the 4070 Super ahead of the 4070. So that's very clear that that's the better product, this, the Super model. Yeah, I mean, that's hard to wait. I think based on all of our polling data, our own opinions and the vast majority of the Harbour Unbox viewers and the podcast listeners, I think we'd have to obviously prioritize rasterization. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, then, agreed. Yeah, I, I, I agonized over this in the GRE versus 4070 Super video that I just did because I still don't know. I mean, I know this is my job, so this is kind of bad, <laughs> but I still don't know how much weight we actually put on ray tracing. And I've talked with others, you know, Steve from Gamers Nexus and I have talked privately. And, you know, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but it, it sounds like his opinions aren't that dissimilar to mine and his sort of how much benchmarking do they do for their day one reviews and that sort of stuff with the ray tracing. They're still a bit undecided. There's a huge list of ray tracing supported titles now, right? Yeah, most games, I'd say, um, have what, some sort of mode. And what would you say? Like, I guessed in my video, like, more than 80% of them probably shouldn't bother having ray tracing because it does nothing in terms mm -hmm. of visuals, like next to nothing, but it slashes your frame rate in some instances half or worse. So is that a good example of ray tracing? Is that is that of net benefit to the gaming community to have that? Or is it just like a checkbox on a marketing thing? 200 titles with ray tracing now, so you must get the best ray tracing performance possible. Like, how many games are, are Cyberpunk 2077, Alan Wake 2, maybe Ratchet and Clank? Uh, you know, how many, how many games like yeah. that have good ray tracing? And I guess that answers your question on... Because it's five years now since the introduction of the GeForce 20 series. Five years since we heard about how ray tracing was amazing, you wanted to buy a GPU with ray tracing support, it was, you know, it was, huge. It was, it was just, it was the, it was the bee's knees. It was the greatest thing ever. We're five years on now. How many games can you honestly say look day and night better with it on? That that's that's kind. Of, I, I don't know the answer. That's that's the sort of the answer I I. I want us to largely agree upon, like, and I guess that'll give you the answer yeah. as to how important ray tracing is. Obviously, on an individual level, if you're like, ray tracing means everything to me. I love Cyberpunk. I love this game. I love that game. I have to have the best ray tracing performance that I can possibly afford. Then it's, well, the GeForce GPUs all dominate the rankings then, don't they? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm sort of thinking back to the games that I've played, and I feel like I play not every single you know major title that comes out every year, but certainly a, a, 
a pretty typical selection of games that a single player gamer would play every year. Like for example, right now playing Dragon's Dogma 2, it has ray tracing. You may as well turn it on because the perform this performance is CPU limited like most of the time. But then Horizon Forbidden West does not have ray tracing as an example. And if I was playing that game, which if I hadn't played on PS5, I'd be playing that as well. And you, there's no ray tracing in the game, so you just wouldn't use it right. So I think in general, there's probably been only a, a couple of games per year, I would mm. say, that I would definitely have wanted to play that with ray tracing enabled. And I'm talking about me on a 4090, like I have the ray tracing GPU, right? So if I think back to like last year, it would have been like Alan Wake 2, Cyberpunk, Phantom Liberty, and I think Hogwarts Legacy towards the start of the year would have been sort of the play that with ray tracing on. But then there were lots of games like Star Wars Jedi Survivor, The Last of Us Part 1, which I played, didn't have ray tracing in it. Um, you know, those sorts of games where the, it, it's either in the game and doesn't do anything or it just doesn't have, you know, ray tracing at all. So I think the bigger factor around this sort of price point if we're ranking the $500-ish GPUs is sort of more features like DLSS. I think DLSS is pretty good at this sort of level of performance because you're mm -hmm. probably playing on a 1440p display as opposed to 1080p where you really it's hard to justify upscaling and you know most games that i play on on my configuration you know i'm using dlss or some sort of upscaling in those games whereas ray tracing is like yeah okay i played maybe three or four games where it was worth using in the last year but DLSS, it's like, yeah, I just turn that on in in all the games, right? Mm -hmm. So, and like, that's how, where... how how much difference did ray tracing for you you think make in Hogwarts Legacy? Would you have enjoyed the game just as much without ray tracing, mm. or or were you stopping and being like, wow, this ray tracing is breathtaking and makes it so much yeah. more immersive? Like, it's interesting. I think if I was buying a higher tier product, the more I'd value that because if I'm spending a thousand dollars that I'm expecting to run all the best visual features, right? So like for me, if I was going like 4090 or 4080 versus a 7900 XTX, sort of around thousand dollars, I would certainly be preferencing running all the bells and whistles cranked up because that's what I paid for, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm paying for the best gaming experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think if I'm spending more around like 4070 level, then I'm sort of less concerned about the best the best visual quality options in the game because it's you know depending on the title and what I'm preferencing it may not even be possible to run those features at the performance level that I'm after just even ignoring whether it is worth enabling visually or not it's just maybe ultra settings aren't possible in in the game I'm after or whatever the case is right so yeah well with the 4070 super which I believe is the product we're currently talking about yeah um, because I just did the testing, uh, playing Alan Wake 2 with the high-quality preset, which is the maxed-out preset, and then a high-quality ray tracing with DLSS quality mode, you're looking at 60 FPS at 1080p and 42 FPS at 1440p, which I guess you could argue is enough for that game. 40 mm. FPS isn't how I'd okay. want to play it. Sure. Um, I would disagree. I'd, I'd prefer more like 60, but sure. Oh, we'll say some people prefer 40, but well, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just speaking for the people that I know are going to say Alan Wake 2 plays fine at 40 FPS. I couldn't agree with you anymore. Like 60 would be my absolute minimum for even Alan Wake 2. So that means mm -hmm. with a 4070 Super, you're limited to 1080p, 60 FPS if you want to use the high quality visuals. And then you get and into- And that was with upscaling enabled, That's right? with DLSS quality. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so you wouldn't want to go lower than that at 1080p, yeah, that's for no sure. No frame generation, but I mean, that's just a frame smoothing technology that's been, you know, mis sure, mismarketed yeah, yeah. to gamers and confused yeah. the hell out of people. So then you get into like the wishy-washy waters of, oh, but you can tune the quality settings to get the 4070 Super to 80 FPS and it's not much of a visual mm -hmm. downgrade. And it's just like this subjective... Uh, S-H-I-T fight. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. So, you know, Cyberpunk 2077, again, 4070 Super, 1440p this time, 68 FPS on average. Um, but outdoor scenarios, you're probably looking at 60 FPS at best uh, on average. Again, that's DLSS quality. That's with the ray tracing ultra preset. I think it comes down to, and I haven't seen your video detailing the 4070 Super versus the 7900 GRE, but... I'm assuming they're about the same level of rasterization performance. Let's say so let's ignore ray tracing for the moment. It's mm -hmm. probably not a huge deal around this price category. Above this, sure. You're effectively paying about $50 more for the GeForce product to get DLSS and other 
NVIDIA features, however you rank those things. But I think DLSS is probably the, the main feature. Mm -hmm. So I guess it comes down to, is, it, is that worth it? Is it worth spending $50 more to get effectively DLSS at the same level of performance? And, then, and I don't know. Yeah, with the Radeon GPU, you have the advantage of an extra four gigabytes of VRAM, which is good, but you know it's hard to say how useful that is just now. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, sixteen gigabytes certainly should be the minimum at that price point, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, maybe slightly better four K rasterization performance. But that's that's about it. So yeah, I, I, yeah, my conclusion was it's like yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not sure which way you go there. Yeah, I mean, if I was thinking like just off the top of my head, like which one of these would I be more likely to buy? Like if I just had to go into the store right now and buy one of those two products. I think I would be slightly more likely to buy the GeForce GPU, but it's not like if there was a slight price difference, right? Like if the, mm -hmm. if the GRE was say $530, which isn't that much of a discount, then you're talking about a $70 discount and then it's like, mm. you know, I'm not, I'm not really willing to pay that much for the NVIDIA features. So, Well, as it yeah. stands now, it's like at MSRP, the NVIDIA mm -hmm. card's 9% more. And we've sort of come to the conclusion, at least at this performance tier, all else being roughly equal, that it's sort of you need a 10% discount with the yeah. uh, the AMD GPU. So I don't know. It's pretty much right on there, isn't it? Well, yeah. If, you, if you're getting an 8% discount, it's just shy of the break even. But then if you went mm -hmm. to, what did you say, 530 to give you a 70% discount, and that gets you to 12%, which is why you yeah. start leaning more towards that. It becomes the more obvious uh, sort of yeah. option there. Yep. And then really, for for it to be just get the GRE, it's way better value. Forget about the you know the ray tracing, that sort of stuff. It's sort of the $100 price gap you would need at that at that price tier, which is about a 17% yeah. discount. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I yep. think once you get to 15 and beyond, that's where, yeah. So it's it's weird though, because we're only talking about relatively small changes in price, but I guess they yeah. eventually add up. Like it does make a difference. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and it depends on the tier of buyer as well, because, you know, the higher up you go, the you know dollar differences make less of a difference. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about $50, but this was, you know, the 4060 versus the 7600, that's a much bigger, that's a much bigger dollar gap. But I feel like if, yeah, I feel like if I was a buyer at everything else as it currently is, I would slightly prefer the 4070 super, but I would prefer the, probably the Radeon cards over the 4070. I, I don't know how that would go. Like whether I'd put say the 4070 super above the two Radeon GPUs, the 7800 XT and the GRE, and then the 4070? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, They're all much of a muchness, They though. are. It's a tough one. Um, and even if you go back and, like, I was looking more over the ray tracing results and you talked about Hogwarts Legacy. Well, the 7800 GRE does well in Hogwarts Legacy um, yeah, yeah, they're they're both around seventy FPS. They're CPU limited at fourteen forty p, so ultra yeah. quality preset, ultra quality ray tracing. They both hit seventy FPS. Um, even Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, like it gets pretty murdered there in terms of margins, but it's still usable. Like with ray tracing in Ratchet and Clank, you can still get around the sixty FPS mark, which I guess right. we're saying is bare minimum. Marvel Spider-Man Remastered, not sure how useful the ray tracing is overall there. I don't spot too many differences, but uh, both of them play really well there. So, yeah, it, it's a tough one. I don't know. I, I, I can't really, those four products, I struggle to sort them in any order that I'm, I feel strongly about. You could just you could randomize them all day, and I'd be like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think as well because it, it is going to come down to the personal preferences of buyers most of the time. Like I'm sort of seeing like if I'm thinking about a general buyer, I think it's very difficult to sort of generalize everything and say get that card. It's more like what sort of games are you playing? Like is it this or is it that? Is it ray tracing? Is it not? Are you more likely to use DLSS? What's your resolution? If it's lower, then it matters less. If it's higher, then it matters more, right? So yeah, I think it, that I I think that those four cards we've been talking about certainly deserve to be towards the top of the rankings because mm -hmm. I think right now, outside of the 4090, if you're buying a GPU, that that's sort of where the best value is at the moment. 
whether you're going 7800 XT or 4070 or whatever. Yeah, I agree. I think that's where the the most value lies. But yeah, the exact order, like I'm sure we'll we'll have to say some order at the end, but those four, we'll put them sort of in their bracket together I, I, almost. Yeah, that's right. I think all four of them are in second place because, yeah. you know. Do you- all right, let's tie them for second. Yeah. That said, I would personally put the 4070 below the 4070 Super clearly. Mm-hmm. I think oh, the yeah. 4070 Super is better value. So that's probably... We'll tie the 4070 Super, the 7800 XT, and the 7800 GRE for second. Yep, I agree. And we'll have the 4070 in fifth. We have to put in, obviously, the 4080 Super, 4070 Ti Super, and the 7600 XT somewhere, as well as assess things like the 7900 XT, which is now cheaper, and so on. So, Well, the 4080 Super sucks, right? Because it's basically a 4080, and I'm just going to go check now as we're talking. Uh, because I haven't looked at pricing in a little bit. I believe they're down now at the MSRP, if that's and what available. you're wondering. I am yes. wondering exactly that. Uh, yeah, so you can get a Zotac model for $1,000 US exactly once you get past all the... Um, yeah, I'm getting rid of all the bundle deals and everything as we speak. <laughs> Luckily, Newegg added the remove combo bundle deal button <laughs> um, a while back. Yeah, so it's still... It's hard to find, though. There's not too many options. Yeah, if you go for new ones and get rid of the open box ones, you're looking at more like $1,100. So there's a Zotac one, sure, $1,000. Not sure if you want to own a Zotac one, hard to say. There's a PNY one I feel equally about. I'm not sure if you want to spend you know, $1,050 mm. on a PNY graphics card. Then you've got a Zotac. And then you get to the first brand that I would consider giving my money, which is Gigabyte, for eleven hundred dollars. And then you've got the ASUS Tough, which is probably a really good model, but that's eleven hundred and forty dollars. So, yeah, how much so was this meant to be again? Thousand so dollars. It's meant to be a thousand dollars. It's possible to get one there, but it's more around the price of the forty eighty. Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't poo-poo the uh, Zotac model. It's a thousand dollars. It may be a really good card. Or it may have half as many, you know, power mm-hmm. stages as you need. I don't know. Um, right, I'd have to go dig into that one. Yeah, I mean, the forty eighty is clearly worse than the forty eighty super. So that's yeah, that's quite obviously how the rankings would go. And I think the we had ranked the forty eighty somewhat in the middle, so high, a little high, pretty mid. But I think with the 4080 Super, it has to be a quite lowly ranked card at the moment. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know whether it's like below a 4060 or something, but I don't I don't think six months later that that card has held up super well. But again, some of those other cards, they're not great either. 4070 Ti, for example. I guess, right, I guess one of the easiest questions would be like, how does the 7900 XT and XTX stack up to the 4080 Super and 4080 at the moment? Where would you have those cards placed against each other? I mean, for value, for example, the 7900 XT has the best cost per frame. So that card is at least a little ahead of the 7900 XTX. Then again, that would be a step better than your 4080 products. They're, they're so different. I don't feel strongly. I almost keep them in the order you've got them. I don't know. Don't know. As in the order that I've currently got them here in this yeah, yeah. document? 7, 7900 XT, 7900 XTX, and then the 7700 XT. I yeah. I'm not sure how much sense that makes. Um, the 7700 mm. XT does drop down to 12 gigabytes of VRM. I feel like I'd have the 7700 XT ahead of the XTX. I feel like the closer that you're getting to the top of the stack, the harder it is to, like, it has dropped in price a little bit. It's down now around just under, like, just around $900 mm-hmm. in response to the, the 4080 Super coming in. So, I feel like if, yeah, I feel like the 7900 XT and the 7700 XT are probably the way to go at those respective around around those sort of prices. And then you get to like the higher end sort of, you know, 4080 type stuff. And yeah. the 7600 XT, is that better than a 7600? Pricing, I mean, it's definitely better. I much prefer, like if they were similar in terms of price, I would definitely buy the XT because the 16 gigabytes of VRAM is usable does mm-hmm. work well, um, will enable higher visual presentation in games. Uh, so will also yeah. probably look a lot better in years to come. But it also depends on the price. And I don't, I mean, it's meant to be 330 MSRP and the other one's meant to be 270 MSRP. And it's like, 
Yeah, so it yeah, looks like sixty dollar difference. There, I, I'd probably put it at. I'd probably put it ahead of the seventy six hundred, but like it would just be just ahead of it, and that's it. I think that's fair because I think, I think the two things that you know they're sort of all similar ish, right? Like seventy six hundred XT, seventy six hundred forty sixty. There's there's similar ish. And then the obvious advantage to the XT is the extra VRAM, and it still feels like, you know, a forty sixty eight gigabyte at three hundred dollars is not the best value product, yeah. especially considering you can buy previous tier, previous generation products around this price still. If we were talking one seventy to like two thirty, yeah. then I would much prefer the eight gigabyte model. But you're yeah. talking about relatively expensive entry level products to begin with, so mm-hmm. you might as well just. You might as well just ensure that if you're going to buy this product and hold on to it for a while, which my assumption is if you're buying sort of people who buy these entry-level GPUs tend to hold on to them a little bit longer than people who buy 4090s and just upgrade every generation because they can. Yeah, And if that's the case, we saw with like an RX 580 that if you bought the 4 gigabyte version, that was a mistake because people held on to them for a long time and the 8 gigabyte model ended up being a lot better. And I think we'll yep. see, well, I know we'll see the same thing with these two. So I would invest the bit of extra money now just to ensure that everything's rendering as it should. Performance is you know, what it should be. Don't have to worry about VRAM. You mm-hmm. can just crank textures up in every single game knowing that you've got enough VRAM for the foreseeable. So that's why I would go for the XT. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think just looking across the rankings... I'd still have them generally in the lower part of the rankings. I don't think like a 7600 XT is a world beating card. Like it's just, it kind of is what it is. Like it is what it is. Yeah. It's mid to entry level. It's 16 gig RAM. Sure. Okay. But I think I would agree with you in terms of it being positioned ahead of those other two models. I guess a couple of battles that I'd be thinking of, you know, potentially switching up would be. Yeah, you know, I think I would personally have a 4080 Super ahead of a 7900 XTX if the 4080 Super was consistently at $1,000 because I think if you're spending $100 more relative to a 7900 XTX, you'd be having expectations of things like more significant ray tracing and you know the rasterization performance of the cards. I think the 4080 Super is, what, about the same, like similar levels. Maybe the XTX is a little ahead. XTX is a little ahead for sure, but yeah. I think our current ranking is where we've got the 7900 XTX ahead of the 4080s is probably where it's at given that the 4080 Super isn't usually at $1,000. Mm-hmm. depends on the model you get, but it's not quite consistently enough there yet. Mm-hmm. So I think that makes sense. And then the only remaining thing would be where would the 4070 Ti Super fit in compared to products like a 7900 XT, for example, which we've ranked more towards the top of the, the rankings? The 7900 XT is uh, much better in terms of value. Like rasterization, it's yeah, it's much better. So I think I'm pretty comfortable. The, the TI Super just it didn't need to exist. It didn't do anything really to... Mm. Um, well, it, did, it gave you the extra VRAM, didn't it? So I guess there's yeah. that. It went from 12 to 16 gig VRAM. So I think that makes it, it's clearly better than the 4070 Ti. Mm. There's, there's no doubt about it. It's clearly better. The question is, how much better is it? And I think the performance wasn't good enough. Like the performance gain over the 4070 Ti wasn't where it needed to be. It needed to be maybe, what did it end up? Just under 10%, probably needs to be more like 15% faster. Um, well, the 700. Depending on price, what have you actually? What have you, you got the seventy nine hundred XT currently at? It's a. It's basically on seven hundred dollars at the moment. Last okay, so that's thirty dollars less than when I reviewed it. Um, yeah. And if we compare the performance of our most updated results, uh, the GeForce GPU is two percent slower. So right. they're the same performance there's a there's a two percent difference there right okay so yeah same sort of i assume that's rasterization performance or that is that is, overall that, performance well that's raster but overall ray tracing performance is a bit of a weird one as well because as we've discussed most games that i can benchmark don't do much so the fact that amd yeah. is you know one percent slower in resident evil or something like that i don't know the benchmarking ray tracing is a bit of a mess basically like I would personally buy a 7900 XT over a 4070 Ti Super at current pricing. 
I think yep. seven hundred dollars versus eight hundred dollars for the TI Super. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess the question is, does the forty seventy TI Super belong above, say, the seventy six hundred XT tier and above the or above the forty eighty tier? Like, does it get higher than we sort of put it right down the bottom in the bottom four of the GPUs? Is it bad enough to be below like a forty sixty? I feel like it's a better product than maybe like a 7600 XT, but I don't know. Probably. I mean, it's so hard comparing entry-level GPUs to mid-range high-end, like in terms mm. of, because you, you're talking about- Yeah, that's true. Like, what's it worth? Um, more than twice as much. Uh, and and yeah. also, I don't really have the data to pull on because because they're so vastly different in terms of price and performance. I don't actually have a set of data that includes both of them because they're targeting yeah. two different they're targeting different resolutions and different quality settings. Yeah, I think it, it's impossible to compare them in that way. I think it's more like has the m lower tier GPUs given people more of what they want than the higher tier GPUs? And the answer so being like, no, I would have thought. Yeah, I would agree. I think the lower tier GPUs, like generation over generation, compared to other options on the market. Like I think of the 4070 Ti Super. At $800, there's no like last gen competition anymore. It's not like you can go back and buy, you know, 3080s or whatever, not that that would even really get up to that sort of level of price. Whereas things like a 7600, they're, they're bad, not overly bad, but they look bad compared to RX 6600s, 6600 XTs, 6700 XTs around that sort of $300 range. Make those products look quite bad. Whereas the 4070 Ti Super, there's there's none of those examples. It's really just how does it stack up compared to the 7900 XT? Yeah, compared to previous generation GPUs, it is faster than the flagships as well. Or it's like mm -hmm. 3090 Ti levels of performance, um, you know, faster than yeah. the 6950 XT. So, yeah, I would probably put it somewhere below the 4080. Um, it's around that mark. Mm. Certainly... I think it's certainly in that group with the 7900 XTX, the 24080s. It's probably in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think I'd be, these days, I personally would be more inclined to buy the 4070 Ti Super than the 4080. But I think if I was buying a higher tier card, I'd, you know, you're spending $800 on a 4070 Ti Super. Could you justify like a 4080 Super spending $200 or $300 more? I mean, I think the 4070 Ti Super is slightly better cost per frame value because it is you know a bit of a lower tier card but the 4080 super is faster so it's hard I, i'm not a huge fan of any of those cards really <laughs> no um yeah that's right yeah i think i think the 4070 ti super might even go ahead of the 4080 super yeah i think i think they've got so. the same amount of vram and it's technically better value yeah. So I would chuck the 4070 Ti Super above the 4080 Super, but below the 700 XTX. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you're spending at the moment, $100 more to get a 7900 XTX versus a 4070 Ti Super. And the 7900 XTX is quite a bit faster for rasterization titles. Mm -hmm. So that sort of does justify the price increase. It's also got more VRAM, not that that really matters at that sort of um, performance tier. And then, you know, it depends again how much you favor ray tracing because a 4070 Ti Super will generally be faster than an XTX for ray tracing, but the XTX isn't like an awful ray tracing GPU. Like it's certainly going to give you playable frame rates in a lot of titles. So it just depends like how many, again, like how many ray tracing games are you playing? How much do you preference that? Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably, I think the rankings that we've got at the moment probably... I reckon that's good. Let's run through them because I think there's sort of almost tier groupings that we'd have them in, which are probably worth mentioning. So at the top, I think we're unchanged in our opinion that the RTX 4090 is the best GPU, um, even with the price increase, still in the number one position, did the most this generation. Then a step down in tier, we've got the tied for second, 4070 Super, 7800 XT, and 7900 GRE. And then a little bit below that, the RTX 4070 in fifth. So... Yeah, the sort of mid-priced $500 GPUs are in sort of a, a good position at the moment. A step down from that in 6th and 7th, we have the 7900 XT and 7700 XT. So I think if you go targeting around that sort of price point, those cards have done enough, especially with discounts. Then a tier below that, 
the RX 7900 XTX, the 4070 Ti Super, the 4080 Super, and the 4080, which is sort of now we're in mediocre territory of like, mm, mm. nothing's doing much for me there. Below that, the RX 7600 XT, the RX 7600, and the RTX 4060. So those are the entry-level mid-mainstream GPUs that have not been that impressive. And then the bottom three GPUs are the stinkers, the RTX 4070 Ti, the 4060 Ti, 16 gigabyte, and the 4060 Ti, 8 gigabyte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm happy with that. I'm happy with yeah, that one. I think that makes sense for our updated GPU rankings for, what are we, April of 2024. Let's take a break and we'll get into our boring lives. All right, we're back, Steve. First up, tonight, the big game, the big mm. AFL match between our two teams, the Adelaide mm. Crows and the Melbourne Demons, is happening, yeah, just after. So probably by the time that you hear this podcast, you will people will be able to look up the result and know which one of us is going to be very upset and which one is going to be very happy. Um, but I'm tipping Melbourne quite comfortably in this one. <laughs> Yes, I'll be very upset if Melbourne lose. They got uh, Stephen Mays back as well, so the back line should be pretty strong. So yep. not loving your chances, but of course anything can happen, I guess. I would say anything can happen except the way that Adelaide's been playing recently has been diabolically awful. So, you know, I will be upset if they lose, but it's kind of like, you know, I've already been quite upset with how they've <laughs> performed, so it's no no real change to the norm, I yep. guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if these two, if our two teams were closer, this would be a much more interesting um, mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. There might be a bit of banter, but I'm just sort of, I've almost conceded just now that there won't really be any of that. I'll just be sitting, watching, probably a bit depressed about how things are going. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> your your <laughs> team's form is sort of hitting an all-time low for quite a while. And I would say Melbourne's form is peaking for for quite Melbourne's a while, been, so yeah, Melbourne's been quite good. I thought against Port Adelaide mm -hmm. last week, they were very good. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed with how they played. Whereas Adelaide, they managed to kick only four goals in the whole match against Fremantle. And if mm -hmm. you're not familiar with AFL, four goals is very bad. Like Freo, very, Fre yeah, very bad. Freo is a good team this season, but that's still yeah not great. So anyway, uh, I can't wait. Um, should be good. Yep, should be fun. But yeah, other than that, uh, oh. Oh, some exciting news, Tim. Yep. The other night we had a very brief, you know, when we got all the rain, uh, came yeah, across yep. the whole state. Well, we had power go out. <gasps> for, oh, you could test things. For all of 10 minutes. And I could not have been happier about that. Uh, so, yeah, the, the power got knocked out just due to heavy rains. Uh, and, yeah, the generator kicked in 10 seconds. So the power went down. All the uh, Blue Eddy power stations that I've had in the stu the uh, studio worked a treat. Everything in here stayed up and running. Uh, apart from the mains, the, the overhead lights going out, I would have been none the wiser. But then I heard the deep rumble of the diesel generator kick in 10 seconds later. Everything nice. went back up and it was great. And anyway, 10 minutes later, the generator turned itself off and switched back over to mains because it detected no fluctuation in power for three minutes. So it was about a 10-minute outage and it worked exactly as intended completely flawless i was extremely happy so nice. yeah hasn't been put to a serious test yet where we get wiped out for days or a week or more but it was good to get uh see it in a real live action scenario uh shortly after the installation so that was cool and yeah really also yeah really really happy with those blue eddy devices that i, I bought the uh, the ups function on them is amazing uh, we actually had to run them for about four hours uh, the day they were installing the generator because they obviously had to cut the power for quite a while. And yeah. that, that allowed us to keep working and doing stuff. And yeah, I, I just had to have them on the trickle charge mode because otherwise they get overloaded. So they could only suck in about 300 watts to recharge, which took about a day, but that's fine. Um, nice. And I've, I've just left it on that mode because I don't need to fast charge them. I think it like the fast charging, it's a 1,000 watts, but you only have 1,800 watts total capacity to play with. So you could only be outputting up to 800 watts in that mode, um, and we need about a about a kilowatt. So anyway, that's all worked well. Very excited to have it tested. Um, yeah, I need to probably get out more because I was very excited about losing power. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. The exciting things that happen in, in – like I feel like – 
you see like the lives of other YouTubers at times and they're all doing like exciting things. They're like spending their spare time traveling. And for us, it's like, there's a power outage. The power went out, Tim. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, we need not focus on that. Uh, and also, you know, continuing that train of thought, Tim, it's been raining, as I mentioned, and the grass, yeah. what is, what's started happening to the grass? It's regenerating a bit. So, My grass has gone from uh, the yellowest <laughs> shade of dead that you've seen in grass to now it's slightly green. Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, I'll probably need to mow it, which is Oh, I reckon a couple exciting. of days, the way the weather's going. A couple of weeks, yeah. it'll be about a foot long. So any day now, peak excitement will occur as we, <laughs> we fire up our hustler lawnmowers and get into it. So yeah. looking forward to that as well. I mean, should be nice. We had half our yearly rain for this year so far mm -hmm. in that one event, like mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. So yep. it's been very dry up until that point, but yeah, it's been nice to see the, you know, good for the garden, good for the farmers, as people mm -hmm. say. <laughs> yep. Something like that. Yep. So yeah, while the tech scene might be boring, we've got growing grass and power outages. It's just, it's all happening. It's on. And we've got a football match to watch tonight. So yep. Very exciting. Know, yeah. Screw fast cars and travel, Tim. You know? <laughs> I don't need any of that. I can yeah. just sit at home, sit at home, watch my grass grow, make sure you know, um, make sure my veggies are going okay and things like that. Yep. Um, I have been playing more Dragon's Dogma too, which I continue to enjoy. So I'm I've played about 20, 25 hours now at this point. I'm sort of up to the second section of the game. Like you get you're in this one section to begin with, and then you can cross a barrier going to the second section. I'm up to about that point in the game, still very much enjoying it. So I'm sure I'll talk about that once I've actually finished it to say whether the game in general is good or not. But I think it's sort of, yeah, it's deserved. It's um, people still continuing to play it on PC and things like that, despite still there being uh, terrible performance issues with it in the cities and things like that. But in general, still enjoying the game. So just a, a quick update to that in case people wanted to check out Dragon's Dogma 2 and they're sort of, for some reason, instead of looking at game reviews or user reviews for people that have finished the game, you're looking at some reason at me for advice, which is, yeah, not sure you get good advice from me on games. But anyway. There's other problems there, but we won't explore them. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All <laughs> right. That's it for this Hardware Unbox podcast. That's pretty much all the things to, to chat about. We'll get into our football match later. And yeah, as I said, it, people will already know the result of that when watching this episode. So yeah, give you condolences to the Adelaide Crows in the <laughs> description below when they lose. Um, we do have our YouTube channel. If you want to subscribe, boost our numbers there for whatever reason. Also, all the audio feeds available. I know they, they just shut down Google Podcasts or something. So condolences to people that... Hmm. used Google Podcast, but Google decided to axe that. But anyway, Pocket Cast is a great app for uh, podcasts on Android and also Spotify, all those other sources as well. So anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for listening and we'll be back next week.